<laughs> okay, so I can talk about dimensionality reduction. What I'm really going to talk about, so I, I call this dimensionality reduction. But we, I could also call this data driven models. Because what's the idea of dimensionality reduction? The idea is going to be we're going to make a more compact representation of our data. And what's a model? A model is a compact representation of your data in a certain sense. Although the last time I spoke, I gave a very clear definition of what a model was. It was a probability for your data given parameters, and possibly also a probability for the parameters. Um, but, but anyway, we're, I'm going to get back to that description of uh, dimensionality reduction. So we're going to come all the way back around, and we're eventually going to have a model, I hope. Uh, we'll see how far I get. But I want to start with a little linear algebra. <coughs> so in physics, all fundamental matrices are permission. They're, or they're square and they're symmetric. Think about all the matrices you know. <laughs> uh, they're things like the conductivity tensor or the uh, curvature tensor or whatever, they're always positive. They're um, positive definite matrices if they're real, and if it's in quantum mechanics, they're always permission. Uh, but that's not true in general. And one thing we have to get over is the idea that all matrices are square. So let's think about a piece of data first. And I'm saying that, it sounds like a joke, but actually we, there was a very nice talk given here a few years ago by Sam about things that Sam Rowe's, uh, who was my collaborator in Toronto, um, about things you can do with matrices, and about three quarters of the way through, one of the part of the physicists asked, but what about blah, 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 blah? And it was clear that the person had just assumed the whole time the matrices were square, and every assumption was therefore wrong, nothing made any sense. Um, so your data, so the way we're going to think about data today is that you have this huge matrix, M, where each column of the matrix is a data point. This is a data point. Is your data point is a column of the matrix. Why is it a column? Because your data is multidimensional. So one way you can think about this data point is it's a set of photons. Like if you're an astronomer, many people here are astronomers. I'm going to use some astronomy examples. Um, each point in here would be the brightness of a star in a different band pass. And this would be a list of brightnesses of the star. And this would be one star. And over here, this would be your next star. And if this is a set of stars you've observed, and every one you've observed all these quantities. Or another idea is it might be spectroscopy. It might be that you've, um, that you've taken spectra of stars, and each one of these is a spectrum of a the star. There's all the fluxes at all the wavelengths, and here's the next star. Yeah? Is this stuff only going to work in the situation where you have kind of n things that are the same kind of thing? Right now, yes. I mean, that's going to be one of the many limitations. In the middle of this, talk, I'm going to talk about why everything I say in the first half is totally useless. And then we'll talk about what comes next. But what I'm going to talk about in the first half is a, pro a method called PCA. And it's PCA is going to be a big part of what I talk about right now, because PCA is this really valuable method that really works really well, even though it's just a mess and it shouldn't work and it doesn't make any sense. That's principal components analysis. That's principal components analysis, exactly. Okay, good. So the idea is your data points have d dimensions, and you have n of them. So you're going to have, you're, actually I'm going to call these, I'm going to use capital letters actually for my big integers. You have d dimensions, and you have n data points, and, th and this matrix is definitely not square. So in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, if you took the photometry, there's 100 million objects of which you have five bands. So that's way not square. There, um, and in astronomy tends to have, astronomy and, or, oh, another possibility would be events. And you can't, it's very hard to do this for events in, in like the LHC, but you can think about it for events in the LHC. But this would be a set of properties you can measure for every event, and these are all the events. But you can see why that it might be hard to think about it in terms of other kinds of data, because LHC events are very heterogeneous, and you don't measure all quantities for all events. And so a lot of the M trees of this matrix will be empty. And we're going to come back to that after the break. The break being where I just bash everything I've said in the first half. Now, 
Computer scientists don't actually think, so if you're a computer science, so this is the way a physicist kind of thinks about it. There's a bunch of observations for each data point, and there's many data points. And we tend to think of the matrix as having this shape. We have tons of data and a small number of measurements for each data point. And that's very common in astronomy, although I know counterexamples. Uh, for a computer scientist, a more typical example is the matrix is the other shape. It looks like this. This data point is a YouTube video, and these are all the YouTube videos. Right? And even though there's a very, very large number of YouTube videos, there's a lot of pixels in a YouTube video. Right? You see what I'm saying? So for a typical data science thing in computer science, so this is kind of the physical sciences, and this is kind of the information sciences, the matrices tend to look like this. Okay? And the, both cases are common. But of course, I can come up with lots of cases like this in so if you take all the white dwarfs for which we have spectra in Sloan, you get a matrix like this, because there's only dozens of them, and they each have thousands of pixels. So if you look at subsets of data in astronomy, it does look like this, and presumably the same in other physical sciences. Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Say again. Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if you're n times d or n times n? Does it matter if does this direction have much, this direction does not have very much meaning. This is not really a, I mean, because lots of, not, actually lots of computer scientists would object very strongly to that statement and would say actually it's just as good to think about this direction. But from a physical science point of view, it's rarely as good to think about that direction, in part because we can reorder these spectra arbitrarily, that doesn't change our data set. It is still the case that in fact, there's, your, your intuition is right. There is actually perfectly symmetric structure in the sense that if there's structure this way, then there is also structure this way. It has the same rank and it has a lot of similar properties. Uh, but, uh, but from now on, I want to only think about the structure that's this way, really, even though you're right that things, these are actually the same problem. Okay, good. Wait, can either D or N be one? Is that fine? Yes, they can be one. It might be a little confusing to think about what I'm talking about if you only have one. Okay. Um, so I'm not really going to think about that. But if you if you just if you just ambitiously carry through everything I say to one, it all works. It's very trivial though. The like the principal component analysis if you have one spectrum is that spectrum. You know that's the mean spectrum and there's no variance around it. So like it's the methods become really trivial when one of them one. Uh, but another interesting thing is this dimension can be infinite. This dimension cannot be infinite, but this dimension can be infinite. There's occasionally situations where you can have infinite dimensions. They're very hard for to have an electronics readout from your computer give you infinite information in this direction. It takes a long time to write it to disk. Um, but in terms of the structure of your problem, this direction can be infinite. So if you're thinking about the, the methods I'm going to talk about apply to things that aren't data. They also apply to things that appear in theory and stuff like that, in theoretical models. And in theoretical models, this can be infinite can have a very high resolution, or you can, this can be like a Hilbert space, you can think of this as like a Hilbert space or function space or something, and then, then it really is, it gets infinite. But it's not really a problem, you'll see why. Everything is held finite by what we're about to do next. Okay, uh, now, if you take these data and you plot them, so if I take this data set and I make a plot, I could now plot it. The problem is that I would need d-dimensional graph paper to plot it and I don't have that right now. Uh, so I can't plot it, but I could plot projections of it. So for instance, I could take a pair of variables in here and plot x, like plot, call this x, this variable. You see this is one variable and this is another variable. Like this is maybe the value of the spectrum at 5, 1, 6, 1 angstroms, and this is the value of the spectrum at 8, 0, 3, 9 angstroms. And then I could plot the flux 8039 versus the flux 5161. And then this set of data would become a scatter plot here, you see? They would be like and there would be, you know, n data points. Plot it, and there I would show some 2D projection, and I could show some other 2D projection. I could make another 2D projection, and in this other 2D projection, it looks like this. I can show you some other 2D projection where it looks like this. 
and so on. There'll be lots of projections where I can just pick any two of these, any two of these things, and I can just plot it. Okay, so that's just keep setting the stage. There's another thing you can do now. Of course, if I'm thinking linear algebra, there's other things I can do than just plot two of these dimensions. I could take a vector in the space and dot it. I could take an arbitrary vector and dot product it into every column, and take another arbitrary vector and dot product it into every column. And then I could plot the dot products. And that would also look like this. You see, you'd get a scalar for every object. In fact, when I took F8039, it's like I dotted it into the matrix, the vector, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the dot product I did to extract those data. Right? Pretty cool. OK, good. So we're all on the same page. Um, now, uh, the idea of dimensionality reduction, or making data-driven models, is to somehow make a description of this data set that is far more compact than nd. This is n times d in size. So if you think of the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey just took its two millionth spectrum. So in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this object has something like 10 billion entries in it. If you take all the spectra, there's something like 10 billion entries and you'd like to be able to describe it with something that has a lot less than 10 billion entries in it. Um, so you have lots of options for this dimensionality reduction, and they are almost all a very bad idea. The one that is the least bad idea from the point of view of physical scientists, uh, as far as I can tell, is to try to write this matrix in the following form. Write this matrix as a very wide matrix that's very shallow times a very deep matrix that's very narrow. See how if I do this, that you have to remember your linear algebra. Oh, except that I've written it wrong already. <laughs> <laughs> you have to write, write, remember your linear algebra, which I don't remember. <laughs> Let's try it again. You want to write it as a matrix that is very tall and narrow times a matrix that is very wide. Where this matrix, if I want to produce an approximation to this matrix, this has to be n in length, and this has to be d in height. And then these two dimensions have to be the same, but they could be much smaller. So this will be k. k is always, if you follow what I say, you'll notice that k is always my model complexity parameter. So k is, so what have we done here? We've treated, we're trying to say, can we make an approximation to this matrix that looks like the outer product of two far smaller matrices? And these will be far smaller in general. So in typical astro astronomy applications I've worked in, k is like, I don't know, seven or three, and D is like 3,000 because we're doing spectra, and N is like 50,000 because we're doing spectra of LRGs. So a typical kind of problem I work on is that this would be about 50,000, this would be about 3,000, this would be about three or four. So this is a really huge dimensionality reduction. Now, even saying that you want to express this matrix in this way is not specifying the problem because you have to decide what constitutes a good approximation. What would make this a good approximation to this? And that's where all the art is. So actually, all the kinds of expansions I'm going to tell you about have this property. Everything I'm going to talk about today has kind of this property in some sense. And we're going to, the only thing that will be different about different things I say is how we decide what contents here correspond, constitute a good model to this. There are lots of other things you can do. So one of the things we have played with a little bit in this floor, but we haven't, it actually got used in the Primus survey. What we did is, instead of trying to represent this as, as a sort of general product of two rectangular things, we tried to say that each of these is exactly drawn from one of a small number of types. So instead of making like each one of these like a linear combination, I'm going to interpret this in a minute, but you can do things where you actually try to replace this with a set of like just five different examples. And every single column in here has to be replaced by one of five singles and different examples. Or whatever. There's lots of other ways you can try to reduce the dimensionality of this than what I'm doing now. But this is the thing that people generally do, and it's a good idea. 
uh, but it has many limitations, which I'm going to come back to. Okay, so what does this look like? If I ask, like, what are the properties of this? Well, what, the, what does this mean? So let's look at this object. So let's look at this data point here, which is data point 931. So here's data point 931. Where, what is this data point? Well, in this approximation, we can look at well, how does this get reconstructed by this thing? Well, what it does is it's the 931st position across here. So we go across the 931st position here, and here in the 931st position, there is a set of k values, which I'm going to call a0, well, I'll call it a1, a2, a3, dot, 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 to a k. Okay, so there's a set of, of values. And when I do my matrix multiply, which I find very hard to do, I'm going to do this, like that. This is my matrix multiply. I multiply this column here by that value, and then I add it to this column times that value, and this times that value, and this times that value, and this times that value. See? And what it's doing is it's treating this true data point as being a linear combination with these amplitudes of these exemplars. So these usually in a, in, are called the eigenvectors. Those are the eigenvectors. They call them eigenvectors. It's not really a good nomenclature because only under some methods are these actually the eigenvectors of a matrix. But anyway. They should really be called like the basis vectors or the, or the model vectors or something like that. But anyway, what, the, what we're going to do in PCA and many of the methods is try to describe this thing as a linear sum of those eigenvectors. That's where we're headed. OK. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, there. Good. Let's, let's hold on for that for a second. Oh, yeah. What I want to say is the 930th object. So if I call this, this data point D931, and the astronomer, and the computer scientists are always weirded out that I put an arrow hat on that, but I put an arrow on it meaning because it's a, it's a set of objects. So this is a vector of data. That's data 931. That's the thing in there. And this thing produces an approximation to data point 931, which looks like this. Data 931 equals the sum from k equals 1 to k of a 931 comma k g k and these are the g k's. This thing is g1 and this thing is g2 and so on to g k. Okay, and that's the approximation. And then what does PCA, so if I want to do PCA, what does PCA do? PCA finds the values. So you have to do two things if you want to make this approximation. You have to choose these k eigenvectors, and you have to choose these k coefficients for every object. So you have this thing has k times d things, which are all of these eigenvectors. And this thing has k times n things, which are these amplitudes. And you have to find all the amplitudes and all the eigenvector values. So it's quite a big search. But it turns out there are certain cases where it's trivial, and one case it's trivial is if I try to minimize the squared error. Minimize d minus whatever I call this. Uh, in the case of 931, the difference is I'm, I'm making a notational error here. You want to minimize the sum of squares. So sum over k, a 931, k, g, k. Minimize the sum of squares between those two things. What does this thing mean? It means sum over the dimension square. You're just taking the dot product with itself. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, but in fact, what you really want to do is you don't really want to minimize for a single data point. You want to minimize for the whole thing. So you're actually minimizing. Uh, I can't write minimize. This original matrix M, and I'm going to call this matrix G, because it contains our eigenvectors G, and I'm going to call this matrix A, because it contains our, our eigenvectors. We want to minimize M minus A G squared, meaning we go 
to every single data point, every single entry in this matrix, difference it from what you get from that outer product, square it, add it all up, and that's what we're going to minimize. And that method, this method, minimizing this, is called PCA, Principal Components Analysis. GA or AG? Do GA. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, it has to be that matrix linear algebra that I claimed <laughs> to be successful in data science. Um, okay, a couple of, uh, well, so the magic of PCA is going to be that it's trivial. It's absolutely trivial. It turns out, you, so you can imagine optimizing this is get, can get hairy. Because, you know, even in the LRG example I gave, this thing has... Uh, 50,000 times 3, and this thing has 3,000 times 3. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of parameters, and you want to do an optimization with hundreds of thousands of parameters. In general, that takes hundreds of thousands squared time. So in general, that's a very hard problem to solve. Um, but in fact, in PCA, there's just a closed form solution, which is absolutely trivial, which I'll even show you in just a second. Um, uh, uh, before I say that, I want to say a few reasons why this might be a good idea. So one, so when I started, I said, you know, w we do this to reduce the size of our data. We're, we're, we're taking this huge data object and we're reducing it to this much smaller thing. It is much smaller. It does reduce the size of your data. Most physicists don't really care about that. We care more about like getting insight about the physical world. So what does it do for a physicist? Well, it depends, and many applications of PCA are totally wrong and have provided no insight whatsoever and not helped people at all. Um, but in the places where it has helped people, it's because it has created some kind of model for the data. There might be some aspect of the data that people don't care about, and they just need a model that kind of works, and then they can just push that aside and then work on a part of the problem they care about. Um, and so it's a, it's a valuable data-driven model. Why is it a valuable data-driven model? Because now you can see that you can make a model of any data point. We can approximate any data point as a linear combination of these eigenvectors. And that, these eigenvectors now become a kind of magically data-created set of templates that you can co-add, and you can, by co-adding them, reproduce any data point. And that looks like a model for the data. It's not quite a model for the data because it doesn't meet my criteria that I wrote down few weeks ago, which is that you have to have a probability for the data. So we're going to come back to that, but we will get back there. But you can see how this is kind of a description of the data that could be very, very valuable. Do the different eye vectors have more importance? I mean, are you yes. capturing everything with the A0, sorry, A1, I mean, or most of the... Good question. We'll talk about that a little bit. One, there's two issues that I swept under the rug. One is how to choose this value K, and then when I talk about how we do it, I'm going to tell you which K. There are many choices. As I said, there's many choices. We're going to make the choice for these that optimize the scalar, that minimize the scalar. But even within that, there's going to be an ordering. There'll be a best one, and a second best one, and a third best one, these, which will be the, related to the eigenvalues of a particular matrix. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, in general, the, zero, the first one of these will do most of the heavy lifting. But there will be individual data points particular data points that depend more and less on different components. Some data points won't talk to any of the components, other data points will talk a lot to various components. It's related to that. It's not single to noise. I wish it was single to noise. The, this method, notice it has no knowledge of noise. We've never said what the noise is. We've just said we have the data. So this method, that's one of the reasons this method is like conceptually unsound for scientists. Is it doesn't, if you know things about your noise, there's no way for this method to capture that. But it is very similar to signal to noise, but it's what it does do. A uh, uh, couple more things. Uh, what's the largest value of k you could possibly use? <clears throat> Which would be? It's either M or it's D. <laughs> <laughs> it's D. 
She said D, but it's not always D. It's sometimes D, but it's not always D. And sometimes M, and it's not always M. Sometimes it's neither. And, 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 did I say M? M. Oh man, I'm using M. Anyway, N. Uh, good. Uh, well, when is it one, when is it the other? Okay, so first thing is, if the data, if the number, if the dimensions of the thing are... It's because uh, then uh, you are getting uh, eigenvectors which are not in the band. If uh, the, the k is, uh, is much greater than the... Oh yeah, there's something weird about the k being much greater than one of these two things, right? You see how there's going to be a problem? If k... So, first of all, if k is much greater than either N, d or n, you're making a mistake, you're not producing any dimensionality, so that's kind of dumbass. But even if you, but if you kind of forget about that and are just on autopilot, one issue is, in this situation, if you set k equals to d, you can exactly reproduce your data. Right, it's a complete basis. It's yeah. just a factorization of a low rank matrix. This is, this, well, we'll see what's low rank in a minute. But anyway, whereas in this no, case, you can't reproduce your data. That's why I'm confused when you say that the K can be either D or N. K shouldn't be greater than D. Ah, but it's in, greater than the exactly Right. Yeah. yeah. It will always be less than the smaller of these two numbers. You can transpose this whole problem. You can transpose the problem. So you'll see, anyway, we'll come back to that. It relates to the rank. So there's this idea of rank. So in computer science problems are almost... Oh, because now you are thinking also of the other shape. Yeah, okay. so you can think of the other shape. So, okay, okay. so another way to think about it, I'm, just, I'm trying to just set some things in your mind because we're going to talk about rank in a minute. Um, Computer science problems are almost all low rank. Like the set of all YouTube videos is low rank in that you cannot make every YouTube video as a linear combination of other YouTube videos. There are some spaces where you can, for sure. But, but, but in general, uh, you can't. Whereas, and that sounds like a joke, but the funny thing is in, in the Sloan data, if you think about the Sloan photometry that I talked about, where you have five bands here and you have 100 million bands here, yes, you can construct any data point in Sloan from linear combinations of other data points in Sloan. That's a possible operation you can do. The, all the data points, because the, the data fully span the space, because there's more than D examples, and they're linearly independent. But in, in many problems, there aren't more than D examples. And so they aren't, they can't be, they can't span uh, the full space. Are they necessarily? <laughs> no, they aren't necessarily. You could have a very structured problem where, in yeah. fact, you don't span the space. And there can be null spaces of these matrices where there's data that just can't exist. Uh, that happens. Um, now, another comment I want to make, which relates to the limitations of PCA, is that we have implicitly decided that we could represent data objects as linear combinations of things. You see how that's making a very strong assumption about the structure of your problem? So for instance, one place I've seen people apply this is in stellar spectra. So you take a bunch of spectra of stars, each of which has a temperature, and then you do PCA, and then you have a, an approximation to the spectra of stars, which are sums of eigenstars. So, but, but a 4,000 degree star is not a linear combination of a 2,000 degree star and an 8,000 degree star. You see, you're, it's very inappropriate to apply it in that context. Or uh, Gabe is thinking about applying this at some level to supernovae. So you have supernovae light curves. A supernova light curve is not a linear combination of other supernova light curves. So spectra, that's it. Or spectra is even more. I'm trying to do that for supernova, but then the question is always, yeah, is it physically meaningful? For right. galaxies, it makes sense if you have different kinds of stars. Good, yeah, yeah. hold that thought for just a second. Stars. Uh, galaxies are made of stars. We think galaxies actually are linear combinations of stars. So galaxy spectra is a place where really this might be kind of a physically appropriate thing to do. And it's notable in the astronomical literature, one of the most productive <coughs> places people have used these methods is in studying the spectra of galaxies. 
It's been much less productive in studying the spectra of stars and quasars because stars and quasars are not linear combinations of objects. Um, but nonetheless, it is still often very useful. The crazy thing is this method is extremely useful. It just basically does things that seem sensible and gives you pretty good. And these things tend to be interpretable. So if you run this on quasars as we have, what you find is the first one looks like kind of a quasar, and then the next one does things like broaden the emission lines or change the ratios of emission lines or change the reddening of the continuum. So you can kind of see that these vectors often are sort of quasi-interpretable because they're structured in your data and these capture the structure in your data. So if you know their structure in your data, of course, a better thing to do is to build a model of the structure in your data and just model your data physically. But if you are either lazy or incompetent, or this is not an important part of your science, it's just something you're trying to get rid of, uh, then this is pretty effective. So there's a recent uh, paper of that last modeling of supernova templates with mm -hmm. PCA. That's right. Then it recovers the principal component number one and two end up being the color and the shape that people Right, that's kind of a typical kind of result, yeah. Is that if in domains where people know a lot about the structure of the data, actually the first time this was applied to galaxies, to my knowledge, it was Bill Press working on the CFA, CFA redshift survey, and he built a, he was trying to automatically identify redshifts, because before the CFA redshift survey, all redshifts were identified by people looking at things. So he's trying to do it automatically, so he built a data-driven model of galaxies. And then when he did it, guess what? The first component looks like an old galaxy, and then the next component looks like A stars, which is what goes up and down as a galaxy looks younger and older. And so it really looked like an old galaxy plus a youth indicator, and then the next one was about emission lines, about the relative ratios of emission lines. And it really buzzed, it really did map onto the things we believe about galaxies. So there are many cases where when you do this, it does map onto the things you believe. But I don't want to endorse this too heavily. I'm trying to be as negative as possible. There's a lot of things wrong with this method. But before I say all those things, I just want to show you how you do it. How you do it is so beautiful. So I opened by saying that, that uh, uh, I'm going to erase this because I want the space, but I don't want to erase anything else. Um, I started by saying that all important matrices in science, in physics, are square. And not just square, but positive definite. Um, or in the case of quantum mechanics, Hermitian, which is the same thing. Um, uh, what is the Hermitian matrix you can make here? What is the positive definite matrix you can make here? Well, there's a very simple one. You you can do M, M transpose. So if I do M, M transpose, so what's M, M transpose? Well, one clue is this looks like your data squared. This is a very interesting thing because it looks like your data squared. You've just squared your data. You've squared your data in the only linearly algebra-y responsible way you're allowed to. Actually, you could have done M transpose M, that would have been a bad idea, as we'll see in a second. Um, if you think about M, M transpose, it's a allowed matrix operation that squares your data. And that kind of should be ringing your bell, because we're actually trying to minimize something which has to do with the square of your data. So this kind of makes sense. So we've squared the data. Now, what does this thing look like? Well, if this is now a square matrix, what size is it? It's D by D. You see, in fact, if I take anything here and I if I take even 931 and I multiply it by its transpose, you see how I get a D by D matrix if I multiply 931 by itself. I get a D by D matrix, and that matrix is symmetric. It's a symmetric squared matrix. So it's a kind of matrix that can exist in physics. And if I have 931 times 931 transpose, I get the square matrix. What's the problem with that matrix? What's unpleasant about that matrix? Why does that matrix make you uncomfortable? It doesn't. <laughs> You're totally fine with it. Good. It shouldn't make you uncomfortable, but it is very, very low rank. So it's, it's very degenerate or it's very low rank. Meaning if you took the eigenvalues of that matrix, say you took 931 and took 931 transpose and you took the eigenvalues of the matrix, what would they be? Well, the first eigenvalue would be the norm of 931 dotted into 931. Right? It would be 931.931. And all the other eigenvalues would be zero. You see how that matrix is really, really well ranked? But this part. does this uh, apply to the other shapes 
or uh, in the other case, it's better to take MTN? Ask me that later. Actually, I'm going to say a little. little I'm going to, we'll say one more thing about that, which will probably answer that question. Um, but in this dense situation, the situations that astronomers find themselves in, usually where it's very dense like this. If I take this, I'm going to get a d by d matrix, and furthermore, it will be full ray because there's so many examples that unless there's some constraint in the data that's stopping the data from exploring some part of the, the linear space, this will in general fill a d-dimensional space. And so in fact, this will be a full rank symmetric d by d matrix. Okay, and what, do you, what does everyone do with a full rank symmetric d by d matrix? <laughs> you diagonalize it. And when you diagonalize it, you get, guess what? these eigenvectors, and if you order them by eigenvalue, you get the first one, and then the second one, and then the third one, and then the fourth one. Okay, so, so that's exactly what you do, and I'm not going to say too much more about that, except that it may, if you... <coughs> Uh, right, but you can just take the first k. Well, how do you know the first k are the right ones to take? Ah, it turns out the first k are the ones. If you rank them by eigenvalue from the heaviest eigenvalue to the lightest, the first k r is the minimum of this operation. It's a miracle. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Did you that? The first one. So you take the eigenvalue. So you take this. You diagonalize. Yes. You take the k vectors, sorry, k eigen vectors with largest eigenvalues. That maximizes that. That creates the G matrix that maximizes that solves this problem. And you know k. Say again. And you know k. You chose it up front through a process that you're unwilling to tell anybody. <laughs> Actually, last time I talked, so a few weeks ago, I don't know if you were in the room, I was talking about model complexity, or selecting among models. How you choose K is back to that. So you have to do things like cross-validation. So you go through here, and you ask at each K, you leave out some data, you ask how well do you predict the left out data, and you do that for different K. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to write uh, prior over K and a posterior. You know, you can do, you can, and then your utility. And yeah, the utility circular reasoning. Yeah, this, yeah. That, this whole method is supposed to tell you what K is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is not supposed to tell you what K is. Well, but no, no, the yes, question was, was how do you know what K is? And you said it's the one that solved. You don't yeah. No, no, K is not the thing that minimizes this. Ah, good, so I was very unclear. Imagine God tells you K. PCA tells you what G and A are given K. It doesn't tell you what K is. But for any K, the first K minimizes. For any K, the first K does the minimization. So if you keep no making what K, 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 you'll keep getting a lower value. You'll get a better and better scalar as K gets better. It's ah. just like the example I gave a few weeks ago. As we increase the order of the polynomial, we just got better and better fits. So do you ever just do a bunch of Ks and see where it That's what everybody does, in fact. Especially since if you're just going through this thing, if you're doing the linear algebra the dumb way, which is create this outer product and diagonalize it, mm -hmm. which, by the way, there are much better things to do than that. But if you do that, then you will get all K. You'll get every possible value of K from 0 to D. And you can just evaluate them all on whatever criteria you like. And people often talk about the variant. They have, people usually look at this scalar. And as k goes up, this scalar goes down. And then they like have an epiphany while they're in a, one of those hot tents with a fire burning. And then they choose that k. <laughs> okay. I see what you're saying. But you can combine it with cross-validation. But, but the, a much better thing to do is cross-validation. In fact, in the projects that I work on, when we're being principled, when we're being lazy, we just say we set k to 7. And then in the discussion, we write, one extension to this project is to choose k objectively. Uh, and then in cases where we're, we're not being uh, lazy, we do cross-validation. The way cross-validation works is you leave out elements of this M matrix. You fit with the elements you can see to these eigenvectors. And then you see how well you predict the left out elements of your data matrix. Okay. But if you can't do much better from 
five to page six. And, and you know, part of your evaluation is, is you it know, so BIC, yeah. Is it for what? Day? Yeah, he, finish your question, but yes. Yeah, no, sorry, what, what, to, you know, what to focus on. So then you can use to, to justify which uh, elements to look at in terms of uh, the, the, the Hermes um, survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're trying to yeah, look at right. chemical yeah, dimensions right, exactly, yeah. you know, space. So they, you know, they come ah. up with seven or eight dimensions. But yeah. you know, I don't think that they necessarily cr cross balance. I mean, no. Right? Many people believe, ah, good, you're bringing up, I think you're bringing up the following point, which is that in many problems, people really think they know what K should be. They think that stars just have a temperature and a metallicity and a angular momentum and an alpha, uh, uh, alpha iron and an H. And so they just say, there are five things. So they just put five and they just run with it. And then they find, of course, it's totally uninterpretable in those things. So projects like Hermes and and Apogee are thinking in terms of, well, how big should the dimension of space really be and try to put a K that's kind of around that dimension. So that's one way to go. Another way to go is things like AIC and BIC. So last time, like a few times ago, I talked about AIC and BIC. If you can, I'm going to draw something and then erase it. If you can do this, then this becomes a chi-squared. And then you can subtract 2 times K or ln D times K or whatever and do AIC or BIC. It seems to depend on like, how much work you're doing. A lot of it, often this is a very, often you're doing this on the inside. Often you don't care about the thing that you're modeling this way. Data-driven models are often used for things you don't care about. So for instance, when we're doing the Sloan survey, we have to model the sky spectrum, the sky in it contributing to every spectrum. Well, we just don't care about the sky. Well, some people do, but almost nobody cares about the sky spectrum. Therefore, we just need a good model of the sky spectrum that basically works. So we just run K at wherever it seems to basically do a good job of subtracting the sky, and we don't really worry about it. And the reason you have that further is because it would make the program slower. It would make the program run slower and doesn't really improve things very much. So you kind of make this decision, well, like, we want it to do pretty well, but we don't want it to right. do well, well, it to generalize. Yeah. Second. If you want it to generalize, you need small K. Just like in all model selection things, as you go to lower K, your model is more predictive but doesn't fit your data as well. And as you go to higher K, your model is less predictive but fits your data better. So it's always that balance between things and depends what you're doing. That's why, this, that's why, as I said last time, and I will say ever, over and over again, it's really about your utility. It all matters what you're doing with this thing. It's whether or not what, who's paying the bills. That's what sets your K. Well, so, but we haven't said anything about how you get those A's. Good. I'm about to say that. Okay. We're nearly there. Also, if you don't have an idea of the noise, that we have a plan. If you don't have an idea of the noise, going to very high K is misleading because at the end you're yeah. you're saying you are reproducing better your data, but all you are doing is keep, you know reproducing the noise. This is why this method has to be wrong fundamentally because it doesn't know anything about the noise properties of your data. There's no causal model for the data. This is just saying the data exists and we can reproduce them. So I'm about to write down the assumptions that this method makes, and they're all wrong. And for all these, then that's one of the reasons they're wrong. Good. Staying on target, this gives you the G's. This, that thing gives you G. How do you get A? The way you get A, these eigenvectors are literally orthogonal, right? Because this is orthogonal. Remember, diagonalization of a matrix, it produces orthogonal vectors, linear algebra. Good. So well, all you do is actually you take these g these g vector these k vectors that are in the g matrix and you just dot them into every object. So you take the first one and you dot it into every object, and that gives you the list of a ones. And then you take the second one and you dot it into every object, that gives you the a twos. And you take the third one and you dot it into the objects, and that gives you the a threes, and so on. It's that easy. That's why this whole PCA thing can be done in if you're clever, uh, d squared time. It's only d squared. It's really fast. Relative to like other problems that people work on, the other kinds of other things, it's very well, I think it'd be faster, right? If you're only interested in a, in a small number of vectors, you can make it faster. You can make it really fast. So I'm just going to say a few things about that. Uh, oh, I want to say one more thing. Whenever you have a symmetric matrix, 
When, whenever you have a symmetric whenever a symmetric square matrix or permission matrix, you can always represent it as an ellipse. This is something that it sounds like a trivial comment, but it really is true. A, a diagonal, a, a square matrix is an ellipse in the d-dimensional space. One way to think about it is you can put it in as the covariance matrix for a Gaussian. Right? What is the variance of a Gaussian? The variance of a Gaussian is always a square symmetric matrix. And so this is a variance tensor because it's the data squared. It's the variance of the data. So you could put it into a Gaussian and then it would make this elliptical Gaussian. So if I want to describe this matrix in the data space, it always becomes an ellipse. And so in these projections, this object will look like an ellipse. And the principal directions are the directions of maximum variance in the data space. You're finding the maximum variance directions. And that's another thing which shows you the method has to be wrong, because your variance in your data might not be produced by anything physically interesting. The variance in your data might be because your telescope was thermal, and it's thermal noise. That might be creating almost all your variance. So this is one of the reasons that PCA is a dangerous thing to use, because it just finds your variance. It doesn't care where the variance comes from. But it is it for the maximum variance? Right. right. So in what case, I guess it depends on the problem you're working on. It depends on the problem you're working on. Most astronomers are used to working on problems where these spectra are high signal to noise. Yes. So the temperature variation of your stars dominates the variance of this data set. But imagine you've taken thousands of spectra of stars and all of them were really low signal to noise and you just wanted to find out things like the mean temperature or whatever. Mm -hmm. then, then the PCA would be a bad idea because it would basically just show you the noise property. Well, it might be a good idea because you'd see the noise properties of your device, but it wouldn't be telling you about right, stars. Right, right. It would be telling you about your device. So what PCA tells you is it tells you about the variance in your data, which you don't know the source of, but it tells you what it is. Why is it used to validate models? Like if you have a theoretical model and you use it to predict the properties of your data, then if that's a solid model, you should recover those properties with PCA. That's sort of true. There's an element of truth there. Well, let's get, when I write down the assumptions, I think that will, it'll be clear what, what the status of that is. Um, let me say one more thing. I'm just going to flash some, some names on the board for you to look at. If, you, if the data set gets really big, so if the data set gets huge, but you want to approximate it with a very small k, there's lots of great methods that do it really fast. You don't actually have to do this full diagonalization. And the other thing is, if you're in the YouTube case, you never have to produce, think of doing that outer product in the YouTube case. See how big that is? That's like a square matrix that's the size of a YouTube video that way and the size of a YouTube video that way. That's a really big matrix. And you don't ever want to instantiate that matrix. So if you don't ever want to instantiate that matrix, the method is called SVD, singular value decomposition. SVD runs directly on this matrix, and SVD produces the eigenvalues and all those co it produces the eigenvectors and all those coefficients for you directly. So usually you just want to run an SVD on this. If you don't remember what SVD is, it doesn't matter. It's scipy.linal.svd. <laughs> And then you have to like figure out, it gives you three matrices back, and you have to figure out which two matrices you want. But only two of the matrices have the right size. So, <laughs> so that sounds like a joke. That sounds like a joke, but that is absolutely God's truth. That's how the SVD works. Actually, <laughs> Some people, yeah. What I mean by you have to understand linear algebra, it means that if I give you this, you have to be able to take an SVD of it. Um, uh, uh, there was something else I was going to say about that. There's not. Second. No, continue. Yeah, there's but, some scaling issue. I, but SVD, the, the nice thing is there's generalizations of SVD that only pull out the first K. So you don't have to SVD the whole thing. You can SVD just down to K, and you get the K out. Now, often, often you want to explore K, so you actually want them all. So then you should just suck it up. But if it's, the problem gets really big, you can limit the K. And then, um, another thing that people don't know as well, there's something called EMPCA, which was made by Sam Roes. The paper, if you look this up, you should be looking for the name Roes. And that also does this problem extremely efficiently for low K. So there's various methods that are good for low K. There's also methods for very high D. So if D becomes infinite or trillions of dimensions, like if D is 
like if this is words in the English language and this is like web pages, whether or not they appear, uh, or how many times they appear uh, in every single web page on earth, you know, your data sets get really large, or YouTube videos, then there are methods, EMPCA and other, there, there's methods that even go beyond this that are about how you deal with spaces that are so large you can't even put the data into your server farm. So, you know, because people work on data sets that are so large you can't even store them, then, then there's even more complicated methods. Yes? So, um, one interesting thing about SVD is that you can, uh, you know, transpose your uh, problem and your solution, you don't have to do it uh, again, right? So in other words, instead yep. of, if you just flip with DNA, yeah, yeah, you can do it, right? Yep. You can say that these are my examples yep. and these are my examples. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this will give you, you don't have yep. to redo the problem to come up with the same exactly. you just transpose the whole thing. That's which right. means, so this is something that I've never really understood philosophically. When you start interpreting this stuff physically, it would mean, it seems to me that there's the, the, the solution to the problem, the PCA solution doesn't give a shit. Which are your uh, That's right. it examples? Like, like, what's the it does your data entries? You know, like it does Which means, which, ones which means, I could have done the other. I could have done m transpose m. I could have diagonalized, taken the first k vectors. That I would have called a, and then it would have taken those vectors, dotted them in this way, like that, and that would have given me g, and that would give you exactly the same answer. Correct. You see what I'm saying? I'm asserting that, and I'm asking you a question about interpretation. So yes, what is, that, what is that? You said that sometimes I was just people reasserting blindly. your assertion. Okay, thank you. So now, when, when people, you say that people often blindly apply this stuff, and they are hoping to get yeah, interpretation. So easily physically interpretable, yeah. but they can't because things aren't necessarily yeah, yeah. a combination. Um, How is this interpretable? No, I'm saying like, you know, is there, uh, is it, could you maybe find things more easily interpretable if you transpose the problem? And there's, whereas yeah. the, the, the math comes out the same either way. The, uh, I haven't thought about that interpretation. I have not thought about that to the transposition. Is what I'm I, the only thing I will say, I basically won't answer that question. The only thing I will say is that if this is a label axis, so often we just have our data and we can arbitrarily order them. But maybe this is a set of labels. Maybe these are ordered in some way that makes sense. And you want to predict labels of new data. So maybe the, a bunch of these are labeled cow, and a bunch of these are labeled cat, and a bunch of these are labeled dog, and so on. And then you get a new one, and you want to label it with one of those labels. Then I think you are going to think about the problem the other way. Even though these are your data points, you're going to be doing things where you try to figure out where you are in this, what mixture of cow, cat, and, and uh, whatever you have. I'll be, it's let, me, let me be concrete, right? So imagine that you have a, a spectral series, spectral time series, right? And if you think about the problem interpretably in one direction, you're yes. trying to, cons this. let's say that you're trying to uh, constitute any spectrum in that series from some basic set of spectra. Right? Yeah. But if you think about the problem the other way, you don't have a time series of spectra. You have a wavelength, uh, you know, for every wavelength, you have some um, light curve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and the question Good. is, is there some finite nice. number of light curves? Good, he just nailed it. You just nailed it. Good, that's very, very, that's excellent. So imagine, good, that even is better than my cow-cat thing. This is <laughs> believe it or not. This is time now, and these are spectra at a bunch of times. I always put reverberation that can be out of Don't confuse me. Um, so these are spectra at a bunch of times. Then each line of this is a light curve at one frequency. And each column of this is a time, is a, and then you can see it's equally interpretable both ways. You can see this as a time series at one frequency, or you can see it as a frequency series at one time. The, the result of PCA might be more easily interpretable yeah. in one of those orientations than the other. This Absolutely. The human interpretation Good. is not necessarily insensitive to transposition. No, for is. sure, and even the physical interpretation is not necessarily insensitive, because it might be in one direction that you can sort of think about the problem additively, a vector additive, in other way you can't. So I think that's a big deal. Yeah, I think that's important, that concept. So it might be that there's some sense in which you can co-add light curves, that a light curve here should be a sum of different light curves, but you can't co-add spectra, that a spectrum here shouldn't be a co-add of other spectra. By the way, why do I keep saying that? Because we're never doing that, right? We're only co-adding these eigenspectra to make the data. Why am I talking about co-adding data? It turns out PCA is a description entirely in the data space. 
you never have to actually instantiate the data. The output, the, the space, the matrices, the uh, PCA output can all be written as linear combinations of the original data. So you never have to go out, you never have to go outside the data. You can actually build it entirely as linear combinations of the data. That's rarely useful for astronomers. That's extremely useful for computer scientists because they can describe their YouTube model entirely in terms of YouTube videos. So the PCA model of a YouTube video based on other YouTube videos can be written just as coefficients times those human typeable URLs. Except the ads get all fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this cross validation would be uh, yeah. complementary, like uh, yeah, just right. Because you're saying like for, for, for the astronomer, it matters to be able to predict things that are not yet needed. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not really going to talk about the predictive power of these models, because that more gets to my thing a few, but I've got enough things to talk about in the last 15 minutes. Okay, what are the assumptions of PCA? The, the assumptions of PCA, I won't, I won't necessarily write these in importance order, but the, the one key assumption is that the data space is linear, meaning it makes sense to co-add objects and take dot products of objects in the space. So that the data space is a vector space. There's a fundamental assumption that it's a vector space. As I said, it's often useful when that isn't true, but that is an assumption. Another assumption is there is no missing data. Meaning, all of this fails if there are nulls in this matrix. There cannot be nulls. Linear algebra does not know what to do with a null. <laughs> ah, if you are missing, exactly, so there's two solutions. If you're missing data, there's two solutions. If I'm missing this measurement of this object, I can just drop that whole object, or I can drop, drop that whole column. Or I can drop both and like shoot myself in the foot twice. <laughs> the problem is, with this, if you take the Sloan spectra, you would have to drop every spectrum. Because every spectrum is missing at least one data point. Or you can interpolate, you can do something else. Fill it Good. In. The other alternative is to fill it in. And people usually do, and what we have done when we have like buckled under and used PCA, is we've interpolated by some dumb method, then we built a PCA model, then we use that PCA model to predict the interpolated data, reinterpolated with the predictions, redid PCA, redo the predictions, and so on. So we cycled that until it converged. Is that known? That yeah. works. Is there a priori reason to know that has to converge? Really no, that doesn't have to converge. converge. It doesn't have to converge, but if the number of missing data are small, it's fine. Oh, oh actually, I shouldn't assert on video that that doesn't have to converge. Maybe it does have to converge, but I don't know. <laughs> that sounds similar to what uh, Fergus was talking Lots about. of people do shit like that. It's not very justified. It's, there's, a, there's a whole method in the astronomical literature called robust PCA, which is a really bad name because there's also a computer science method, which is totally different, called robust PCA. But anyway, uh, lo there's a lot of discussion in the literature about interpolating over the missing data. So this, this assumption is just always wrong in astronomy. I don't know any data set where that assumption is OK. So you either have to interpolate or drop data both of which are unpleasant. Um, the next assumption of it is that the noise, the noise in your data, meaning the part of your data you don't care about, like the photon statistics or the thermal noise of your telescope or whatever, the instrumental noise, is small. It assumes that the variance, the large variance directions, are actually created by things you care about, not by, um, not by things you don't care about. And then finally, it makes a, an assumption, there's an assumption which maybe I should put in parens because proponents of PCA would disagree with me on this, but there is basically an assumption that the data are drawn from a Gaussian. And the reason I say, I, I say that's an assumption is because if you try to justify PCA as, a, as the outcome of a probabilistic calculation, the only probabilistic calculation it could be, it would have to involve diagonalizing this matrix. And the only place I know in science that you would be diagonalizing this matrix is if this matrix was the covariance tensor of a Gaussian. So not everyone would agree that PCA makes this assumption, but it does kind of implicitly 
PCA does a good job when all of these distributions look like two-dimensional Gaussians. And that's why I deliberately drew this one so it didn't look like a two-dimensional Gaussian because your data don't usually, this property isn't usually true. And this problem, property not being true is often related to this property not being true because if the, your space is not linear, it basically can't look like a Gaussian and if it can't look like a Gaussian if your data space isn't linear. These are very related uh, assumptions. Okay, good. Basically, I would say none of these assumptions are true for any problem we care about. One of the few problems is galaxies. This is close to true for galaxies. Um, but uh, when you do, when you run PCA, you start, when you run PCA in a real problem, you start to see all of these assumptions appear. All of these, uh, these problems hit you. You find that if you interpolate stupidly, you see interpolation artifacts in your PCA spectra. If you take PCA to large K, at the early Ks, you see like the mean galaxy and an age indicator, but then you start to see like cosmic rays you didn't get rid of and stuff start to appear in the PCA components. So usually the PCA components start to get really weird artifacts in them, which have to do with the fact that your noise isn't small. You think your noise is small, but you, your eyes are good at ignoring that huge cosmic ray hit that's sitting there in the image. or. Uh, or a sky subtraction error at the edge. So you can see this beautiful galaxy, you go like, oh, it's such a beautiful spectrum. But PCA doesn't know to ignore the fact that the spectrum does this at the red end. And you know to ignore that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's not just that the noise is small, but that it's uniform too, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're absolutely right. It assumes homo schedastic. Um, although, if your, mo if your noise is small, this is irrelevant. You see if your noise is truly small, this is a, you don't have to worry about this. What is that word? Small? It means all of your data points have the same noise properties, which is never true. At least in astronomy is never true. Every data point has different noise associated with it because transparency is different, the object is different, brightness, whatever. With the telescope is behaving differently. So usually this isn't true, but if the noise is truly small, you don't have to also assume this. Compared to the, uh, compared to the, the signals, the K signals. Just because it's not going to end up more than the bonus. Because it won't end if, if the, the noise is small enough. I'm being a little vague by what small means, but if, if, as long as it's small enough that the noise doesn't enter into your top K components, it doesn't matter whether it's also homo Doesn't it mean that if you compute the variance from the data itself? That's much larger than the noise. Mm -hmm. That's right. Another way to say it is that if you made the same this tensor for the instrumental noise, it would be much smaller, at least for the first k. At least the first k eigenvectors of your noise tensor would be smaller than the first k eigenvectors of your. So that, is there a rule of thumb that can relate how, the, how small the noise is to say? Yeah, you can calculate yes, the variance from the data. Yeah. You can form the same with yeah. the yeah. the same sum over sigma square, calculate sigma square from the data itself. Yeah. And if that number Good. is more than one, then you can calculate the variance from the data. Yeah. 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 Y
you know, like so it's like <clears throat> like this, then that's kind of saying that PCA, there isn't much structure in your data, it looks like it's random noise. So for instance, if you just do random draws from a circular round Gaussian, many, many draws from just a round Gaussian in the space with no structure, this thing will be very, very close to flat. So basically, taking out components doesn't improve your fit at all. And so the fact that it does this says that there's structure in your data. It, and people uh, feel proud that PCA is finding that structure, but PCA like, can't not find the structure. It's like impossible for it to not so find. So when people say that like, you know, X number of, K number of components accounts for some percentage of the variance, quantitatively, what does that mean exactly? No. Uh, no, no, I'm saying how do they arrive at that? Oh, they just take this K of zero point and the point where they cut off and they say this is 90% of this. That's all. That's all they're saying. It actually does have one use, which is that if you are in coding theory, imagine you're trying to do compression, use PCA to compress messages and send messages over a noisy channel. The, the variance is relevant to like message transmission. If you knew nothing about the structure of the data, it's just being blown at you by an oracle, and you had to transmit it over a noisy channel, this is a relevant calculation for that. So in as much as science is an oracle blowing data and you're trying to transmit it over a noisy channel, that's a good thing to do. The funny thing is, <laughs> yeah, Brendan's about to say that actually that's exactly how he yeah, sees okay. science. Right. In fact, there is a complete correct description of science as an oracle blowing data at you and you're transmitting it over a noisy channel. The noisy channel is called the astrophysical journal, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the oracle is the el readout electronics of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, yes? Uh, so shouldn't this go to zero when k becomes our d? Yes, when k gets to d, this will literally go to zero. That's why I'm being rough here. That's why I have this tilde. I'm assuming d is way over there. Or n, n is way over there. Either n or d, or well, both n and d are way over there in this assumption. If they're close to this, it will literally go to zero. Oh, yeah, it goes to literally zero. Yeah. Very good. That's a nice intuition. That shows that a, you're paying attention, and b, you know linear algebra. Okay, good. Uh, now let me say one more thing. I uh, just erased our assumptions, but I don't care really. I'm going to solve a few of these. So what we, what, what are the alternatives? I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to sketch what is the alternative. The alternative, there are two kinds of alternatives in general. One kind of alternative is to say, really, I have my matrix M. And in, different, in addition to my matrix M, this matrix M you can think of as being a set of vectors, D1, D2, D3, like this. These are data vectors. In addition to those, usually if we're doing a physics experiment, this is quite different in biology, it's different in, engin it's different in engineering, it's different in management science, but in our business, usually in addition to these data vectors, we also have some noise vectors. Sigma squared one, sigma squared two, sigma squared three, which relate to, excuse me, which relate to the noise we think we have in the data. So we have some precision or noise or inverse variance or variance or whatever. We have some noise information. And what we really want to do is we want to say, what is the probability of the data matrix we saw? I'm going to call this, this isn't really a matrix. I shouldn't draw it as a matrix. It's not really a matrix. Because each column of this is actually a covariance matrix, which should be, so anyway. But anyway, let's call this thing psi. I'll put an arrow and not an equals to say this is like some other kind of object. But, Really, if, we want, if we're being responsible, we should be writing down the probability of the data given our matrices G and A, which are the matrices that we're going to use to dimensionality reduce, and this uh, information about our noise. That is really much closer. Brendan's still not happy because this doesn't have priors, but this is at least the likelihood. This is a, what's the probability of the data given what we know about the noise and these things? And in the case that your noise is Gaussian, if you want to do the same model and your noise is Gaussian, this is actually not a hard problem to solve. It is a completely solved problem. It's actually been reinvented in the literature at least six times. Um, one of those reinventions is by me. <laughs> Um, 
there's Talmanza and Hogg is a method called heteroscedastic matrix factorization, which is not my best name ever. <laughs> Nobody even knows how to spell it. There's actually two spellings that are both allowed by the OED. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's also, this was also found by Blanton and Roes. So two people on the same call reinvented this. <laughs> Um, it also appears in the chemistry literature. We found it a bunch of places. But you can see that if your noise is Gaussian, you see you're going to be able to just write this down. The data vector is just the data vector is just the the eigenvectors times the relevant coefficients plus a Gaussian noise draw drawn from this, and that's an objective function. And you can just optimize the likelihood. So you find the g and the a that optimize the likelihood. It's a lot more painful than PCA. You don't have a closed form solution. You have to put it into an optimizer. But it's not that bad. It optimizes fast. It converges fast. It's a good problem. In fact, it's a bilinear problem. This is a, and many problems in, in physics are bilinear problems. It's this times this equals this plus noise. That's a very common problem. In fact, in image analysis, there's a true image convolved with a PSF equals the data. That's a, also a bilinear problem. But lots of problems in astrophysics and probably physics in general are something, some, some specific information times some general information equals the data. And, but there's a difference which is the calcium noise. And then so the, there's various methods here. In computer science, the generalization that's probabilistic, which has never been used in astronomy to my knowledge, and I don't know why not, and Ross Fadley, who just left the room, and I are about to uh, change this. It's called the factor analyzer. And this will satisfy Brendan. Um, the factor analyzer is that the, is the idea is that the data, each data point is drawn from a Gaussian, which has which, and a Gaussian which has some mean and then some variance, which is your noise, your known noise. I guess I should call it sigma squared d. I'm going to write something that is, this is fake math. This is like mathistic, what I'm going to write. It's your fake noise added in quadrature. It's your, the instrumental noise you think you have added in quadrature. That's supposed to be sigma squared. This is supposed to be n, sigma squared n. Because we're talking about object n. There's a mean. And sigma squared n added in to a low rank thing which looks like this. This is some low rank matrix which has k vectors in it. So you put k vectors into this low rank thing, take the outer product with itself. This makes a low rank symmetric tensor, which is like your PCA basis. Then you, you add it in quadrature to your noise, and that's how you generate the data. And then in this formulation, because this formulation like has this nice uh, vector tensor thing, you can put nice priors on this, and this is a full probabilistic model that would satisfy all of you anybody's concerns. And the nice thing about this model is it treats the data as being drawn something which is a convolution of the stuff you care about and the instrumental noise. And so you are modeling the part you care about under the noise. So this is a forward model. So the noise, you know, when you have variance in your data, it's, a, it's the true variance convolved with noise. Here's the convolution happening right here. So the forward model is doing the convolution here. This is now lambda is D is K ID, it is a low rank object which uh, contains your eigen information. And this is fully a probabilistic model. It's a generalization of PCA. There are fast algorithms for optimizing it. It is better in every respect. And anybody using PCA should probably be using something like this. You can also, as I was just saying, easily put prior to the I'm done. I'm late. Sorry. Thank you.